Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. Hello, I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I want to thank you for joining us for today's Kaffeepause. At our Kaffeepause events, we regularly check in with a journalist based in Germany to talk about the news stories behind the headlines. And today, I am absolutely delighted to speak with the Wall Street Journal's Germany correspondent, Boyan Panchevsky. Boyan, thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot to talk about today, um, but I am very happy that you're taking the time on a busy news day to spend some time talking with us. Hey, and Steve. You, thank you for having me. I'm I'm delighted to have you. And, and as I, I as our viewers know, as our listeners know, I often like to start the Café Pausa by talking about the political mood in Berlin. But today I'd like to, to switch it up a little bit and start by talking about Chancellor Olaf Scholz's announcement on Saturday regarding a military aid package to Ukraine totaling nearly $3 billion and Ukrainian Vladimir Zelensky's trip to Germany. Um, he was in Germany over the weekend as, as part of a trip across Europe. How have um, these developments been received in Germany? Can you talk a little bit about the Chancellor's announcement and then about the, the reception of Zelensky um, on, on, later on Saturday and on Sunday? Yeah, so essentially this has been seen as a very positive thing and it kind of improves Germany's standing um, in the eyes of Germans themselves internally and externally because, uh, as you will remember, in the early weeks and months of the war, Germany was seen as a laggard. It, uh, Because of its sort of uh, history with Russia, because of its pacifist, kind of structural pacifism that it, it had as a policy prior to, to this war, and because of the complexity of the political system, uh, you have to always remember, no matter what you're talking about, uh, when you talk about Germany, it's not an executive system like the United States, perhaps, or France, or even to an extent, Britain. So it's it's quite consensual. There's always a coalition. There are always different politi political parties and so on and so forth. And so uh, Germany was long seen as dragging its feet. It, it it was the target of a lot of international criticism. If if we remember, it was it was quite often unwarranted and and sort of ill informed the criticism. But nonetheless, it made a it made a dent on Germany's reputation, and certainly on the reputation of Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who had just basically come to power when the when the war uh, broke broke out. Um, so essentially, this is seen as a huge improvement. Uh, the package of, of, of military assistance that was unveiled in time for the visit of President Zelensky is, is quite huge. It's 2.7 billion euros. Not everything there is new. Some of the stuff has been discussed prior to the announcement. But nonetheless, these are very, very important, very useful pieces of hardware. They include tanks, tanks infantry fighting vehicles, uh, crucially, they include aerial defense systems, something that Ukraine desperately needs to have to sort of uh, counter these constant missile uh, uh, attacks from Russia, and, and includes other things um, as well. And part of, the, part of this hardware was actually sourced by the government of uh, Scholz, um, including by his own National Security Advisor Jens Plutner in uh, overseas. So there, there was a very sort of coordinated, concerted effort to source weapons for Ukraine. And some of it was sourced domestically from the industry. Some of it was bought from foreign governments. And so it's it's kind of a, it was a substantial effort. I think Schultz is kind of getting the credit for it, finally, in his view, in the view of his advisors, because they felt he's done a lot, but he never got any credit for it. And so the, this kind of crowns um, Germany's uh, achievements so far. I mean, Zelensky, President Zelensky himself, he held a, a press conference at the Chancellery, sitting alongside, standing alongside uh, Chancellor Scholz, and he really kind of heaped praise on Scholz, on the government of Scholz, on the German people. He thanked the Chancellor personally. He thanked his government. He thanked every single German taxpayer for supporting Ukraine. And he said Germany has now risen to be the second biggest military backer of Ukraine after the United States, um, which is which is quite a big thing. And I think it's 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 sort of it's it's been received here as as something uh, entirely positive. I think and definitely 
it is a development that will make a difference on the battlefield. Obviously, it remains to be seen to uh, what extent uh, this will make a difference once the, this this long expected counteroffensive begins. But certainly, the the German hardware, the German kit, is now being put in place and is desperately desperately needed. So and I think it's also it, it also kind of shows, if I may finish, just the you know Germany is a kind of a large tanker sort of smack in the middle of the continent you know and and for 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 decades it it has uh, had this policy of of restraint when it comes to the armaments industry when it comes to delivering weapons to conflict zones it had a very sort of benign russia policy benign for putin that is um very tight energy cooperation and so for all these ties to be severed with russia for all, this whole entire mindset to change to kind of redirect the tanker to its towards kind of full steam ahead military support of a warring party you know that took a while and and if you think about the kind of how huge that task was politically i mean first the chancellor had to organize a majority in his own party and then sort of moving on to the coalition and so on who's going to pay for this and how is this going to be paid for you know these are extremely high uh, uh, levels of expenditure um and so i think you know in a way it took about 6 months to change course so it's not in the grand scheme of things it's not it's not hugely um long uh, for for such a sea change to be achieved but obviously in a 24 hour 7 news cycle in the days of twitter and so on it's it's quite it's quite it's quite hard on politicians to mm-hmm. <laughs> to take their time and and you know, sort of do these big projects. Well, and and as you said, both both Scholz and Germany um, have have uh, sort of suffered a little bit from the fact that there has been this this hesitancy, if you will, um, and so this does kind of turn that around. I think in in many senses, timing is everything, and the fact that this announcement took place just before. President Zelensky arrived in in Berlin was good to reset the relationship between Berlin and and Kiev and particularly between um, Scholz and Zelensky. But the other element of timing is something that you touched on briefly, which is there's been a lot of talk about the start of the the Ukrainian counteroffensive, um, and there's been a lot of concern by the Scholz government that. Um, the weapons that are provided be used for defensive purposes and not necessarily for offensive purposes into into Russia. Um, given the the timing of the announcement and the timing of the counteroffensive, how quickly is it expected that the hardware that's been promised will actually make it to the battlefield? Yeah, well, you know, it's a very pre- particularly German thing to 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 uh first to kind of worry about weapons and then to declare there are defensive weapons and now finally tanks and missiles and artillery <laughs> counts mm-hmm. as defensive weapons obviously that's just a matter of perspective there are no defensive weapons really in war but um uh I think they've been pretty quick I mean the some of the tanks some of the infantry fighting vehicles all of the artillery so far, Two of the these highly complex state of the art aerial defense systems called Iris T, uh, all of that has been delivered already. So, so Germany has been very quick to deliver, and it is expected that these items will will go over uh, very very quickly. Not all of them; uh, some of them need to be produced. I mean, some, some items will actually be need to ma- be manufactured, so that that will take a while. But but some of some of it will definitely be on the front line in time uh, for the offensive. So I think it's it's pretty significant contribution in that sense. And also, we have to remember that Germany has now a new defense minister, Boris Pistorius, yeah. who uh, replaced the predecessor um, Lambrecht, who was. Uh, who was quite often seen as kind of not being able to control the sort of uh, sprawling bureaucracy of the defense ministry. She wasn't necessarily minded to 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 press forward with 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 military equipment. You know, she also comes from a kind of a pacifist background from that part of the Social Democrat Party. And so there has been an enormous change, very visible change, both in rhetoric, in the kind of perceived leadership, 
and in in Germany's um, in Germany's kind of performance when it comes to delivering military aid to Ukraine since Pistorius took office. And he's basically gone out, and one of the first things he said was, "I want Ukraine to actually win this war, and and I want Putin to be defeated." And um, you know, this is kind of what they call klar text here in Germany, sort of this kind of clear rhetoric. Uh, that we haven't been hearing before from his predecessor. So I think that also helps. There was an instance where Poland was uh, willing to give MiG-29 um, uh, jet fighters to, to Ukraine, and these MiG-29s have been given to, to Poland by Germany in the 90s, and, it, it, and therefore they had to be approved, and that transaction had to be approved, and, and he basically approved it uh, within hours, which is, which is quite extraordinary. And, and so I think we'll, we'll see, we'll see um, you know, greater expedience. We have been seeing, and, and we'll, we'll see greater expedience uh, in, in, in months to come. So, so very briefly, the, the other topic um, related to this that I wanted to ask you about is um, Vladimir Zelensky uh, yesterday received the prestigious Charlemagne Prize from the city of Aachen. Um, that yeah. prize is, is generally given to people who uh, bring Europe together. And so it's, it's sort of interesting that the, that the jury decided to award this prize to Zelensky and the people of Ukraine for bringing Europe together in the way in which it, it has come together. Um, since the the invasion of Ukraine by by Russia, how how has um, how has the German public responded to to that um, sort of acknowledgement um, and and the pomp and circumstance around that that prize? I think it was a largely positive response by the media. At any rate, I mean, I'm not sure how much the public at large is is aware of the price. I mean, these things are normally sort of known to to a certain bubble uh people who deal in politics and the media and think to, to the European Union this this price is kind of tied to the European Union in a way um but certainly it was seen as a positive thing um he uh, Zelensky is a more or less uh, kind of a popular figure in Germany He's certainly beloved by most of the most of the free press here and so uh i think it was definitely a, a you know because normally Actually, the, the the awarding of this prize is not is not broadcast live necessarily every year, and this year it was it was a big event, obviously because of uh, President Zelensky being there. Scholz himself held a speech uh, at the ceremony, and as did uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, which is the executive uh, arm of the European Union. So it was a much higher profile event this year, I have to say. In previous years, it has had uh, very high profile recipients. I mean, Angela Merkel, while she was chancellor, got yeah. the prize. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron during his presidency. Pope Francis got it as well. But I think it's, it is at least my subjective feeling that the, um, Zelensky got a, a bit, bit more media attention yeah. than, than prior recipients. So, so Boyan, you you've recently been writing about relations with China and about the potential of of Beijing brokering a peace deal in Ukraine. And this week, China's special representative on Eurasian affairs, Lu Hui, will visit Ukraine, Russia, and several European countries as as part of Beijing's effort to act as a middleman. Um, what do you expect to come out of this week's shuttle diplomacy by Beijing? It's very difficult to say. So the special envoy, uh, who who used to be, by the way, ambassador to Russia and speaks fluent Russian, he will visit Ukraine for the. He will be the sort of first senior official to visit the country since the beginning of the full scale invasion in uh, February uh, 2022. Uh, he will come to Berlin as well, and he will come to Paris, as far as I'm aware. Um, and so it's it's kind of difficult. Western officials are not quite sure what to expect. I mean, obviously, they're very skeptical and suspicious because China is 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 very evidently in, an ally to Vladimir Putin and, and and to Russia. And I think that that is a structural thing that will will not be changed anytime soon. Yeah. Especially not since since uh, the United States are are kind of getting into a deeper conflict with China, and and therefore it's only natural that China and Russia come together more closely. So nobody has any illusions about that, but there is a sense that even if you get 
And this is what the officials are telling me who are kind of working on these negotiations, that even if you get the Chinese to sit on the peace bench during any type of future negotiation that might take place, be it a peace conference or whatever other format talks might take, it's always better to have the Chinese sitting on the peace bench and sort of neutral, or, uh, at, but not sitting on the Russian bench and kind of fully supportive of, uh, you know, Team Putin. Yeah. So as yeah. long as they're not officially Team Putin, um, that's already a kind of a concession and, and that's already a good thing in the eyes of, of Western diplomats. So I think very much that's the kind of base expectation. I mean, it might, it might get better than that, obviously. I mean, we need to remember that China managed to broker a arrangement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and that is uh, that is quite an extraordinary achievement. It took years to to happen, and I think Iraq and other countries played a key role. But nonetheless, China was seen uh, as as having kind of orchestrated that effort, and obviously that is something that the United States can't do because they don't have a relationship to to Iran. Right. And similarly, now the United States, as as the greatest Western power, would be you know struggling to 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 organize a peace settlement when their relationship with with russia is so hostile as it is and therefore there is some sort of glimmer of hope that uh, that the chinese could play a constructive role they certainly have indicated that to various western officials and leaders including Pre president emmanuel macron who visited beijing who spoke to the president uh, of china about it and and apparently got a pledge that they will get involved in it constructively. So it basically remains to be seen. I think this week is quite important because we'll see after that tour of Europe, of selected European capitals by the Chinese envoy, we'll see, um, we'll see where they stand and what, what, what perhaps we'll know more about what, what exactly they want to do. So we will certainly be, be watching this in the days ahead. Um, but but thank you for sharing your insights on that. I'd like to stick with the international arena for just a moment longer because um, there were very important elections held in Turkey yesterday. Um, the the parliament was elected, but neither of the the front runners um, as as president broke the fifty percent mark, and so they'll now face each other in a runoff election in two weeks. Um, how closely was the election in in Turkey followed in Germany, and and how is Berlin responding to the 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 election results right now? Well, it was followed very very closely. Uh, Turkey and Germany have a very profound special relationship, not least because in Germany there are over three million people of Tur perhaps more of of, of Turkish. Uh, origin and there are 1.5 million voters actually people who are eligible to vote in turkish elections and so uh germany has a huge interest in what happens in in in, in turkey uh germany also has at various levels a profound economic and political uh, relationship with turkey uh, we only have to remember the kind of refugee settlement that was brokered by then chancellor angela merkel which essentially um stipulated that Erdogan would, uh, President Erdogan will stop the refugees from coming to Europe and Germany in exchange for uh, um, large amounts of money uh, from European taxpayers. And that is still in force in a way, that settlement. So um, there's, there's a great, definitely great interest. Um, it would appear that the political classes or parts of them at least were quite keen for Erdogan to, to lose the presidency, certainly the, the Green Party, which is one the, uh, uh, which is one of the coalition partners in the government and nominates key ministries such as the foreign ministry and, and the Ministry of the Economy. So the chairwoman of that party, Ricardo Lang, issued a recommendation, which was fairly controversial here, I think, for, for Turks to vote Erdogan out. Yeah. Um, that's not been the case with other parties. In fact, uh, um, members of parliament who who are also members of, of different parties uh, other than the Greens and who um, who are of Turkish origin said that it's not it's not very clever to make recommendations like that because Turks are cantankerous and they don't they don't want to hear from Germans how how they're supposed to vote. But in any event, what we've seen here are, are sort of huge lines in front of the polling station. So I haven't yet seen a proper sort of survey, a study of uh, how they voted and how many of them voted. But there was certainly a sense among the experts here in the Turkish community that it could be a record turnout. 
for for the Turkish voters in Germany. And it wasn't clear what that means. Are they mobilizing to support Erdogan as they have been doing in the past? So in the past, the majority, the vast majority of Turkish German voters have voted for Erdogan. Or is this the case of, of, of perhaps critics now um, or people uh, who want Erdogan out mobilizing to to vote against him? Uh, in, in any event, it was a, it was a huge turnout. And I think in the in the second in the second round they might play a key role because obviously there will be a you know it will be a very a very close call and I think that diaspora vote could could help tip the scale among other mm-hmm. things. One point five million voters that's that's a pretty substantial uh, yeah. that's a pretty substantial segment of the overall vote, voting uh, population. So that's also something that we'll have to to watch and sort of see how that how that unfolds um, in the in the weeks ahead. Of course, um, there were also elections in in Thailand yesterday, um, but the elections in Turkey and Thailand were not the only elections that were held over the weekend. Mm-hmm. Germany's smallest Bundesland, the city state of Bremen, also had an election, and the Social Democrats have emerged as the clear winner um, in the election. The Greens suffered um their worst results in in the the state um city state in almost 25 years can you talk a little bit about um the the election results yesterday um and then maybe we can start by talking at the local level what what your assessment is but then look at that mm-hmm. in the broader context of what does this mean at the national level for the, for the the parties yeah, the mighty, the mighty city-state of Bremen, uh, a former Hanseatic sort of stronghold. Um, it's, I mean, it has to be said that they've been voting Social Democrat for about seventy years now, so it's not, it's not exactly an earth-shattering kind not of a surprise. surprise. What happened, yeah, what was surprising though is that a party, uh, a sort of a protest party, so populist party, uh, won uh, I think eight, nine percent of the vote, and the Greens did pretty badly. And there, I mean, the first sort of uh, analysis show that some of some of the green voters shifted back to um, to the social democrats uh, which they had been voting originally perhaps um it's very difficult to say what this means for federal politics because you know on, on local elections people vote because of local issues and you know i'm always i'm always very cautious about sort of deducting grand conclusions from mm-hmm. from elections like that because you know they've got with parking spots, with the local economy, with, you know, housing, what have you. Certainly, it does seem to feed into this trend that we are seeing. Um, Political scientists and pollsters are are kind of charting across the nation that the Greens are on the defensive, that after they peaked and they had this sort of enormous spike in popularity for being in power for a while, uh, I think uh, the Greens are confronted with the fallout from the discussion about some of their policies in the federal government, which relate to to climate uh, to climate change, I mean they're basically the the green ministers are pushed for some very popular policies, such as exchange, uh, you know banning the sale of uh, all new gas based heating systems yeah. for households by uh, next January, and that's that's hugely controversial. Uh, obviously, it was agreed in uh, with with the other coalition partners, but nonetheless, the Greens own that policy, and people seem to now realize the price of combating climate change because Germans are very much in favor of combating climate change. Uh, you have to know that whenever there's a poll, climate change is right there up, you know, in the top ten, if not in the top five, sometimes in the top three of issues that worry um, Germany. And so Germans are, you know, they are anxious about climate change and want to do something about it, but they've not been made aware of the actual price for their own uh, households and their own wallets. And now that's slowly happening because the Greens are in power and they're trying to do something about it. And that's highly unpopular. So I think what happened in Bremen, I think they lost almost 5% in uh, compared to the previous election, the Greens. So I think that's part of this broader trend that we are seeing. I mean, the, the Greens are now, I think, equal with the Alternative for Deutschland, the Alternative for Germany, which is a kind of far-right, anti-migration, anti-Islam protest party. And so that's 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 pretty that's pretty bad sort of beating in the polls for for the Greens for the moment. But obviously, it's early days, and there's no federal election coming soon. So 
that doesn't have to mean anything. It could it could also mean that um, the policies of, of Olaf Scholz are, are sort of slightly vindicated. Certainly the social democrat spin doctors will have you believe that. They, they're all now kind of out in force saying that, look, Bremen shows that we're doing the right thing and people, people support Olaf Scholz. But I think the truth is people in Bremen voted for their very popular sort of um, mayor slash prime minister. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, who has very local persona, very local policies, and uh, very local kind of concerns, and, and I think that's that's the truth of it. So let's uh, let's stick with the Greens for just a moment, and then and then come back to the Social Democrats because the some of the Green leadership are drawing some consequences from this, right? Micah Schaefer, who's the head of the Greens in in Bremen, um, mm-hmm. announced her resignation and that she's going to leave politics. Um, there has to be some concern in sort of the corridors of, of the the Green Party um, after the very poor results in Berlin in February, now the poor results in Bremen um, about the direction of the party. And, and I did wonder, and you talked about this a little bit, sort of how much um, of this has to do with the debate around um, the heating systems in residential units but also, it seems as if um, Robert Habeck, the the vice chancellor um, and economics mm. minister, has been embroiled in a couple of controversies, um, yeah. including around Patrick Griechen, which some of um, our Café Pausa regulars know that we talked about a little bit last week. Um, yeah, but curious. it seems as if as if um, there have been some other issues that maybe have have contributed to to this. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think the the two most damaging sort of media stories about the Greens have been the debate around heating uh, and the heating systems, and and also the debate about sort of alleged nepotism in in the ministry run by Robert Habeck, which is the Ministry of the Economy and Climate. And so, uh, obviously, he's a his right hand man, so to speak, is is this Secretary of State Kraken, who. Yeah. Has been employing friends and and um, and people close to him, and there is a kind of a whole network that now emerged, according to media reporting, of of people who are related to each other in some ways and 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 friendly to each other, and and there is sort of an old boys network is now come to power. It's being presented as as a story of nepotism. I think even newspapers that support the Greens have been highly critical of these disclosures. Uh, because that's just the way Germans like politics to be done in, in, in their country. It's not, it's not something necessarily typical that happens at that scale and at that level, certainly not. So that has been damaging, definitely. Um, I think overall, Robert Habeck has been the target of a lot of criticism because partly because it has to be said, because he works quite hard. I mean, it a lot of the weight of of, of the of the adjustment to the new realities after after Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine, i.e. completely cutting off Germany from from Russian supply of energy and and sourcing other sources of energy and building LNG terminals, terminals for liquid liquefied natural gas. Um, That's all been in his portfolio. So he has he has had to do a lot of work and he has done uh, quite a few mistakes. I mean, that's probably typical for people who work a lot, they, they make mistakes a lot. But nonetheless, his public persona has taken some beating because initially he was extremely popular. He's a very good talker. He's very persuasive when he goes to these popular German TV debates, uh, TV shows with various panels and things, uh, mm-hmm. very popular in Germany. And he was very, he was doing very well there. But now his personal ratings have suffered and also the ratings of his party has suffered. Um, in contrast, uh, his sort of rival within the party, Annalena Baerbock, who is the foreign minister, has not had to do the similar type of work because her ministry is not necessarily in charge of writing laws or dealing with the economy or, or, or with the crisis from the war. But she's she's had this huge platform and she travels a lot and she, she speaks quite often um, in the media because of her role. And nonetheless, that hasn't really seemed to be uh, very helpful for party as a whole in terms of ratings, and her personal ratings have not have not been that great either. So there is a slight disillusionment with the Green Party, I think, um, uh, as reflected by the polls. 
Now, what the Greens will do about it remains to be seen. I mean, there are obviously strategic deliberations within the Green High Command, and they will they will have to do something uh, um, closer to the elections. The problem is some of these policies are their flagship policies, you know, like cha uh, changing the heating systems in, in, in the houses, changing the way houses are built, insulation and so on. Um, some of this is there. They're, they've been fighting for this as a, as a, in, in the opposition for decades. And now they're finally in power and they want to deliver to their voters. So when you look at the poll, their core supporters are quite happy about what's happening, partly because they are urbane kind of bourgeois, urbane bourgeoisie that can afford the costs that are necessarily you know, going to be imposed on people because of this. But the, the, the voters who, who joined them just before the last election, who are not sort of died in the wool greens, are starting to become disillusions and they're having second thoughts and they are perhaps returning to the original parties they used to vote before that, like the Social Democrats, or, or moving on to, to the Free Democrats and so on. So it's it's a tough time for for the Greens at the moment because of the implementation of their policies and because of the way they implement them and because of the public outcry. Um, so it, a lot of sort of uh, analysts have suggested that the pace of these reforms mm -hmm. is too fast. You know, you can't just tell people, oh, by the way, by January, you can't buy gas heating anymore. Yeah. Uh, so now there's a run on gas heatings, for example, and and then that has also had sort of a knockdown effect on 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 various industrial companies. I mean, famously, one of them decided to sell out to a United States competitor because they didn't think they would uh, manage uh, the German market given given the new regulation that's coming and the competition. So it's uh, it's it's tough time, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it all pans out. I mean, I think yeah. that you know, this is this is a period when when the German voter is actually starting to understand what combating climate change means. Yeah. I think there is a collective failure on behalf of politicians to explain to people, or has been at least in, in the past years, to explain to people what does it all mean? What does it mean for right. the price of energy? What does it mean for the price of housing? What does it mean for the price of heating? Uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So so let's come back to the, the SPD in, in Bremen for just a moment. Um, as, as we both mentioned, the SPD seems to have won the election, has won the election, um, not by as much as they've won elections in Bremen in the past by, by a long shot, but certainly they have a, a strong margin and the incumbent mayor, Andreas Bo Bo Bovenschulte, um, is also likely to, to lead the next city government. Um, and as you said, it's it's undoubtedly due to the popularity of the Social Democrats locally that that has contributed to the victory of the party in, in Bremen. But there's an open question as to what the next government will look like. And Bovenschulte has um, a couple of options, including the continuation of the current red-green-red coalition um, with the SPD, the Green Party, and the Linkspartei. Um, or he can form a grand coalition of the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats. And he seems to be keeping the options open at the moment, um, saying that he would you know, engage in discussions with all of the Democratic uh, parties. Can you talk a little bit about, about Bovenschulte, um, the SPD, the likelihood of the next uh, sort of the format of the next of the next coalition? Well, I mean, I don't know. Um all that much about him he's uh, apart from the fact that he's known as bovi but uh i think bovi has the option as you said of of keeping on uh with the coalition or or reverting back to the grand coalition and and in, in when when um earlier this year in berlin there was an election and and the government the then um social democrat uh prime minister slash uh mayor faced the same choice she eventually opted for a grand coalition which meant she lost her job as a as a as a mayor uh and and now is a is a kind of a minister in the in the berlin government so the reason for that was partially because she always had wanted to reform berlin and she didn't necessarily think it was possible with the setup she had um but also because voters were quite unhappy about the co coalition that was in power and i think similarly this will be the dile dilemma for bovi in bremen because um you know if people kind of turned against the coalition partners they're obviously not happy with what they've got and it would be quite a challenge to impose on them 
the very same coalition they tried to vote it out to vote out although obviously that's democracy and the figures are there and they can do whatever they like with the results but i think it would be a challenge to tell voters well you know what we'll just go back to um to the old coalition how about that so uh we'll see i mean i've seen people sort of suggest that he might go uh, opt for a grand coalition and what that would mean for 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 the federal um system uh, going forward uh, I think there are quite a few people who thought that the Grand Coalition worked better than than the current coalition. But then again, you know, they are not the ones who are going to make the decision. So we, yeah. we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. So the, the other you know party that, that I think is also worth talking about is the Free Democrats, right? They barely broke the 5% hurdle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and are represented in this government. I think um, in FTP circles, there were some concerns whether they would break the 5% hurdle or not because of their showing in, in the elections that they've been um, part of, I guess, in the last five elections, they've continuously been losing traction. Um, so they didn't do well, but they did well enough at least to be in government. What's what's your take on the, on the FDP, um, both on the state level, but then also on the national level? I think the FTP, even more than the Greens, is are facing a, a crunch both in in kind of uh, state politics in, in in regions. I mean, they've been battered in election after election since they came to power, and and the Greens similarly are are having a similar experience. But I think to a greater extent, this has been challenging for the Free Democrats because essentially they are unable to pursue any of their policies properly in order to even satisfy the core voters let alone attract new voters whereas the greens at least the hardcore greens are happy so they're not sort of dissipating the hardcore but they are sort of losing the people they managed to gain um prior to uh, to the last election federal election that is so it's a also are in a tight spot it's very difficult the finance minister which is pretty much the most important person in government after the chancellor is Christian Lindner, who is the the leader of of the Free Democrats. Um, And he's in a position to have to throw money around like confetti, which is anathema Mm -hmm. to his voters and to himself. But nonetheless, the situation has been imposed by the war and by the cost of living crisis and by the fallout from the from the COVID crisis, you know, this multiple crisis coming together and that they kind of the policy response is, is to to subsidize a bunch of things. And 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 to prevent social unrest by by basically state investment mm-hmm. into into all sorts of things supporting consumers and businesses and he is the one who has to do it and that is kind of paradoxical because he's the one who wants to to shrink the state he's the one who wants less not more mm-hmm. public expenditure this is what he campaigned on he wanted to kind of cut welfare a little bit he wanted to invest in innovation he wanted to invest into sort of the industries of the future, and mm-hmm. all that agenda has been sidelined. So, what do the, what do they stand for? It's very difficult to say because for the Greens, at least, they're taking a battering, but they stand for what they stand. Whereas the Liberals stand for what they stand, and they can't do anything about it in terms of realpolitik because their hands are tied. So, it's it's I don't see how they can get out of it. I mean, the result of this. What I've just dis- described is 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 a pretty uh, sort of disruptive tension between the two parties, as as both of them are trying to kind of put a mark on federal politics, on the politics of the government of Olaf Scholz, and so this kind of back and forth between the two is generating a lot of friction. Germans don't like that. They don't like infighting. They don't like bickering. They don't like their politicians to be sort of publicly uh, yeah. due. Over, over policies in the way that they do at the moment. So it's um it's 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 a tough time for the liberals. And I wouldn't know what's I mean, some some people say they should just sort of go real hard on 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 their on their and draw the le- red line in the sand and so on and so forth and defend their policies. But that's going to be very difficult because events obviously always uh, affect policy and not, not just the programs of, of yeah. politicians. But what I think one thing is is what is really needed to understand is that if you look at the German coverage of, of the coalition government, there is a strong sense that the turbulence is coming from that sort of fight between the Greens and the Liberals, which is only partly true. The truth is, however, that it would appear, certainly to me it appears from my conversations with, with people in government, that Chancellor Olaf Scholz and his finance minister Christian Lindner are very much on the same page on a number of issues 
and they actually are confronted by a different position by the Greens, by the ministers in in the coalition, because you know the, they explained that with with the very long uh, period of time that the Greens had spent in opposition, and that they want to sort of now pursue a bunch of projects and and pursue them quickly, and they're kind of failing to find the necessary compromise or perhaps take into consideration the pain of the coalition partner in a way for the greens they you know it's better for them uh, if if christian linda is losing yeah. his ratings because they compete for voters but that's not how chancellor olaf Scholz sees it he sees it as a project that he needs to yeah. keep up. and therefore it's 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 quite it's a very complicated situation so I'd like to to bring up one more topic about the the Bremen election that that struck me, and and then close with a, a question from one of our viewers. Um, I was sort of surprised and interested to see that just over twenty percent of the vote went to the parties uh, on the periphery of the political spectrum. The yeah. left party got over eleven percent of the vote, um, which surprised me, given that Bremen is a, a West German city state, and mm -hmm. the the right wing. Bürger in Wut, loosely translated as, as furious citizens, um, yeah. won nearly 10% of the vote, 9.6% of the vote. They benefited from an exclusion of the, the alternative for Germany, the AfD, because they had formal errors in registering yeah. for the election. But still, between the Linkspartei and the Bürger in Wut, you have just over 20% of the population voting for these um, sort of more populist extremist parties. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about that trend? Yeah. Well, I mean, that you see across the country, really. I mean, even at a federal level, if you, if you look at the, the polling now for, for uh, I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to put the Burger in Wut, which, you know, it could also be translated as citizens in rage or enraged citizens. And um, you can't really compare them to the left party, which is an established uh, party. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily that extreme and certainly not as extreme as the IFD in some parts of Germany. But, you know, parties, roughly speaking, on the fringes of, of the mainstream um, have been gaining traction uh, for years now. And ever since, I mean, pretty much ever since 2015 and the great and the last great migration crisis under Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, people have been disappointed in the mainstream and not just for reasons um, that were evident at the time, you know, this kind of migration issues that they had, but also because they don't really see change no matter who is chancellor and no matter what party is in power. Yeah. And I think you've seen that fatigue with the mainstream. Uh, a lot of pollsters have been, I mean, one of them, one of them is, is, is uh, Manfred Dullner, the, the, the head of FASA. He's done a lot of research and written books about this, that the danger of people becoming structurally disillusioned with politics to the extent that they stop voting altogether. And, and there is a huge reservoir of non-voters in Germany becoming ever greater with every election. And Bremen is definitely mm -hmm. a, a sort of a great example of that happening, actually, that that big, dark reservoir of people who are fed up with politics and they just don't vote anymore, or when they vote, they vote extreme parties or protest parties, is, is becoming ever greater. And I think uh, the ceiling for that, I, I remember I saw a confidential polling by the CDU party, the Christian Democrat party of Angela Merkel when she was still in power. And they said that the ceiling for the IFD in their estimate was well over 20%. This is, you know, going back now four years, perhaps. And certainly other people agree that the ceiling for these protest parties is pretty high in Germany, dangerously high, you would, mm -hmm. you would have thought. And the reason why they're not doing better, uh, although they're doing quite well, if you think about mm -hmm. it, now 16 percent IFD day on a level, depending on the poll. Uh, in, in the east of the country, they are the majority. The IFD and the Linke are already opposing majorities in, in, in various states, such, such as Thuringen and mm -hmm. Saxon and so on. So um, the reason why they're not even doing even better is that they have very poor leadership. I mean, typically, the leaders of these parties end up being corrupt or or embroiled in various scandals or just not very charismatic or or frankly not very intelligent even I mean, mm -hmm. they don't come across as very attractive to the german voter and therefore they've they've been stuck in the doldrums for for a while but you know yeah. the danger is that they will once get a properly charismatic leader who will manage to unite them 
behind their leadership. And then in that case, you, you would really see the real effect of this, yeah. of this dark reservoir of people who are absolutely fed up with mainstream politics. And I think, you know, what's happening now with the cost of living crisis, the energy crisis, I mean, the prices of energy will not drop to pre-war levels in Germany anytime soon, unless they're hugely subsidized by the government, which is not a permanent solution by any means. You know, obviously these this subsidies will run out um, at a time where we have 4% interest rate on, on borrowing yeah. money. So uh, yeah, the, the situation is actually worse than it looks. Uh, German voters are pretty sort of sanguine and responsible people, but they are also to a large extent fed up with the mainstream. And because you always keep, you see the same refrain in poll after poll that, that nothing really changes. They have some grievances. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about uh, their local communities. And, and I, I don't think things have improved to an extent where where they would just tilt back to the mainstream parties in in a huge way, yeah. So so Boyan, you you almost anticipated my my closing question because I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask you a question about the German economy. And you you started to talk a little bit about the the mood when it comes to the economy, but I actually have a, a perfect closing question from one of our viewers who writes. German economic growth indicators have slowed down recently and are lagging resilient activity data in other parts of Europe. Inflation is simultaneously still high and remaining sticky, despite a fairly aggressive hiking cycle by the European Central Bank. How closely is local press in Germany covering these concerns, and what's the mood in the German public regarding the state of the economy? Well, the mood is pretty gloomy. I mean, obviously, these issues are covered very closely. And, and I think there is a, I mean, studies are showing this. There is the IFO Institute in Munich that shows the mood among managers and, and, and company owners. And the mood has been declining uh, in recent months. I think uh, industrial orders are down. Growth, uh, as, as, the, as, the, as the reader, as the viewer uh, said, is, is, is down and predicted to stay down. So it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty uncomfortable situation for for the government and certainly the structural challenges of the German economy are huge. I mean, your you know the German model was thriving when it had access to comparatively cheap German um, Russian energy and the vast Chinese market, which which is still a driver of growth yeah. by the way for Germany. But these things are changing. The geopolitical setting is becoming ever more hostile to uh, an export nation like Germany. So the, the, they, they've been cut off access to, from access to, to Russian cheap energy. So energy will never be as cheap again or not in the foreseeable future anyway. Um, there are huge problems with China. Uh, there are huge pressures from the United States to, to now the popular term is de-risking, to de-risk the economy from exposure to China. Uh, basically, that means to trade less, uh, which is not a great proposition for anyone in Germany. Mm -hmm. I think not in the short term, not in the midterm. And so these are great challenges. Um, you know, obviously, the digital transformation of the economy, the, the, you know, electric vehicles don't really use that many components. Electric engines are much simpler to make. So the whole ecosystem around the auto industry, which is the kind of the backbone or a part of the backbone of the German economy, certainly is going to evaporate and all these jobs will be lost. There's no question about that. That's already happening. It's in progress. And, and so how do you compete with um, in, in the sort of electric battery sector with China when China is subsidizing, doing all sorts of uh, practices? That, you know, so it's and then you've got America, which becomes ever more hostile to, to Europe uh, uh, by default. You, you know, the presidency changed. The, the tone of the presidency changed mm -hmm. drastically. Uh, it's much more friendly, much more conciliatory now with the Biden administration. But uh, the, the kind of the motto remains America first. You know, you've got yeah. the, the CHIPS Act, uh, the, the sort of the Inflation Reduction Act. All these things are basically designed to learn, to lure European and global businesses from Europe to, to America. And the proposition the European, the Americans are making to German companies is come here, we've got a, a huge integrated market, uh, easy to deal with. B, we've got cheap energy and it will stay cheap. And C, we've got subsidies for you. W what's not to like? How about that? So um, 
you know, it's tough. It's tough. There are structural challenges for the, for the German economy. You know, I'm, I'm wary of making sort of Cassandra predictions because the Germans are quite good at reinventing themselves and, and coming back with a vengeance. So it remains to be seen. But certainly there are structural issues that need to be overcome. And any government has this problem of an aging population addicted mm -hmm. to kind of a very, very complex and, and, and sort of opulent welfare state. And the need, the things they need to do to unleash growth, to unleash innovation, um, it's tough. You know, I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be a German chancellor anytime soon, to be honest with you. No, it is a, a challenging time on multiple fronts. Um, but, but Boyan, I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today, for shedding some light on some of those issues, and for pointing out some of the things that we should be watching in the months ahead. And I'd be delighted to have you back again in a couple of months to to give us an update on on how you how you see what's going on in Germany today. Sure thing. Always a pleasure. Well, this was a, a terrific conversation. So so thank you again to you, and of course thanks to everybody for tuning in for today's cafe pausa.